Welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast, the photo imaging industry's leading news source. Here's your host, Gary Peugeot. The Dead Pixel Society podcast is brought to you by Media Clip, Advertech Printing, and Independent Photo Imagers. Hello again and welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. I'm your host, Gary Peugeot, and today we're joined by Iz Shalom, the co-founder and CEO of Ali, the AI photo assistant, but it didn't always used to be Ali, it used to be something else. But first, let's talk up to Iz. Hi, Iz, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. So, Iz, you've got kind of an interesting background uh, before we get into uh, Ali and the app and what it does and what the opportunities there are. You've kind of kind of always been, in my just from reading your background, kind of been in the, the storage world, like the online storage space. Can you talk a little bit about kind of where you started and how you got into that? Yeah, uh, I mean, not always, but certainly the last uh, seven years or so. Um, before that, I was an engineer at Google, but I found my way to the Google Photos' monetization arm, if you'd call it, uh, which is called Google One. If you end up depleting your 15 gigabytes of storage today, you will be prompted to purchase Google One. Uh, and we were the team who I was lucky to be part of that team that launched it. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now it has, it was just announced that it has 100 million users. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've oh, been in that space. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's uh, So thank you for your business. And uh, yeah, we saw it kind of firsthand and photos and storage related stuff. And later on, I actually went to Dropbox to their lead their consumer business, mm -hmm. uh, which was also really interesting. I saw very much the same problems. And when you think about storage footprint for actual consumers, so like not in business scale, it winds up being photos and videos. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of been my, my background. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about kind of that business case for that, because back in the day, you know, when the internet was new and all that in the 90s, early 2000s, people are saying no one's going to pay for storage, right? No one's going to pay, different people tried it, no one could ever make it work. Um, yeah, they're all kind of different, you know, locker type environments or whatever. But it seems like whether it's a cultural change or just because people just have so many pictures online, they, they feel they have to pay to protect them. Um, what do you think? has been driving that because I, I don't know what percentage of Google users have Google one, but it's probably a reasonable percentage to continue that service. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty reasonable uh, portion. And if you think about it, actually with Apple and like the percentage of people who are paying for iCloud, it's even higher, um, right. which is like very impressive. If you think about it, mm. um, I think, Two things, uh, two secular trends that I can point out to. Uh, one of them is simple. It's just the photos and video taking has increased. Yeah. Ever since the mobile revolution, like you can probably see it in your camera roll. Like you used to take, uh, you know, I don't know, a couple of hundred photos. If you're not a photo enthusiast specifically, then you're taking a few hundred photos per year. Now it's in the thousands right. uh, per year. So, so that has just increased. Mm. Um, the second thing is generally the idea of paying for something over the internet has become we've accepted that much 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 more yeah. i remember like you know it's now 2024 in 2004 you would be like really hard pressed to pay for anything in the internet right i remember buying my first uh my first ipod touch dating myself a little bit mm -hmm. uh but uh i remember I was appalled by the fact that I have to plug in my credit card to set up an Apple ID. I was like, <laughs> I don't give my my list. so like the 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 infrastructure for payments or for micropayments, et cetera, became much more much simpler. So I think everybody's will much more willing to pay for a subscription mm -hmm. period. And I think you know storage, like with anything else, is enjoying from that trend because I think in a lot of ways, uh, people can't really cope with their content, right? They, they create so much of it and they don't really, you know, they don't really want to delete a lot of pictures and everything. And that's kind of is going to roll into our Ali discussion, obviously, but it, it does kind of address a need that I think people have where, you know, it, it used to be storage used to be an inhibitor, right? It used to be expensive, right? Buying a hard drive was a big deal. And, you know, you know, people were buying all kinds of, you know, removal media to store their pictures on. And there used to be like full album like devices. People would store that. It was weird, too. It was a weird era back in the 2000s where you'd have like a photo album kind of thing. But it was just filled with, you know, SD cards or whatever. 
people would store their pictures. It was, it was really weird. And then it migrated online, right? And you, and you had some of the photo services doing that, right? You had um, clearly, you know, Shutterfly, that was their game for a long time, was, hey, just upload everything and, you know, eventually you'll want to print it. And I think that kind of deteriorated as the volume got to be very expensive and people weren't printing as much. And then you have kind of the storage people um, getting into that with the, um, you know, Amazon, obviously Google doing that Dropbox doing that. Actually Dropbox used to have, you know, carousel and some great products for that. But it, it was interesting to me that that never really, it was more the storage people becoming the, the keepers of memories, not the photo people. Why do you think that is? Um, storage is really expensive <laughs> uh, and if you don't do it uh, it's actually becomes a problem a technological problem of how to maintain those data centers mm -hmm. in a way that is cost efficient right uh, i can't get into the numbers but sure. we were when we we're at google one we were acutely aware of how much it costs us to store a gigabyte uh like in a really replicated in a way that it's not going to go not going to be lost right uh and uh, we were like really really good at assessing that and making sure that we have a profitable business mm -hmm. uh, and and that comes only with scale um and you know google and apple and dropbox are companies that are fortunate to have the scale to merit like a really deep architecture and thinking about it like really really deeply mm -hmm. so i think that's kind of what's changing and on the other part that's interesting is, you know, all of those people have kind of made photography piece almost the centerpiece of it, right? I'm, it used to be you would only get certain uh, editing features in your app, your Google Photos app, if you subscribe to Photo One or Google One. I, I, I think they've changed that policy, but that was sort of one of the incentives was, hey, you get the, the magic AI, the blurring, the portrait mode and all the other fun stuff. And, you know, the other people have responded to moving away from the, the past and going into the present and hopefully the future. Uh, tell us a little bit about Ali, which used to be called Good Ones. So how did you make the jump from, you know, being being in, in, in a two huge companies, right? Dropbox and Google to doing your own business. Yeah, uh, well, that story starts actually like way back uh, when I was just launching Google One and my daughter was turning one mm -hmm. and I was faced with the orangutan task of uh, making a photo book <laughs> for her first year. Right. And I think just about a billion photos <laughs> and videos of her. <laughs> Like you can, I, back then, uh, like we used to have this like little graph of how many photos you took per year. And so like, you can see kind of like this, like almost invisible graph at the bottom, mm -hmm. three, my daughter's days, like it's like on a handful of photos, mm -hmm. thousand, a couple of thousand growing slowly. And all of a sudden, like when my, my daughter is born, take a bunch of photos. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at the past and it, it, it took me like, I, I don't, uh, I don't even finish it. It took me like hours and hours right. and I gave up essentially. Right. And I realized like for all of this abundance of storage, I was really doing less. I was revisiting my camera roll much less often because it was such a cluttered space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's all the other stuff in there. There's receipts, there's uh, exactly, all the exactly. other stuff. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting you mentioned kind of the photo book dilemma because that's like the trick that the industry has been struggling to to solve for 20 years right that was almost the this is going to be the golden product that's going to save the industry because who doesn't want a photo book right and then back when i was at the photo marketing association back in the day you know we did all this consumer research and it really came down to you know i think the number was as high as 75 percent of photo books that are started are never finished and the number one reason we asked consumers, what was the reason why it was always as I don't have the photos I want, right? Or I can't, I don't, you know, they're all in different places, there are different services and all that other stuff. How did you decide that the camera roll, make a camera roll centric app as opposed to one that pulled from 17 different services? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Photo retailers, energize your sales with Share Me Chat the proven texting platform. Using chat to text on your website keeps your customers connected and buying. See us at Pro and IPI to find out why dealers using ShareMe Chat close more sales without adding staff. Find out more at shareme.chat. 
honestly just talking to a bunch of people i just <laughs> talked to people uh, to you know uh, just started talking to uh, primarily parents to be honest mm -hmm. and i said okay like do you have do you own a dslr uh do you because we own a dslr mm -hmm. you know where it is uh, you can find it any weekend in my drawer mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and the dslr doesn't really go out and i think like people especially with the um, as the technology has progressed and you can have things like a nice like portrait bouquet effect and things of that nature mm -hmm. i think the quality of a photo that a lay person can take uh on a on an iphone or you know or an android or a high-end android like a google pixel has shot up dramatically oh sure uh, yeah. and then sort of the percentage of photos that are like that are in the camera roll it became like close to a hundred percent, you right. know, save for, save for sort of like really like, like semi-professional, like the shutter bugs who are going to do DSLR and then they're going to go to Adobe Lightroom anyway. Right. So for the lay person uh, who's not like, who doesn't have time to, to manage it, like in a really high end production way, which by the way, initially when I was conceiving of this idea, I was thinking about a desktop product. Right. And when I talked to people pretty quickly, they're like, oh, I would not open a desktop product for this. It has to be simple has to be mm -hmm. uh kind of I, I should be able to do it on the elevator was right. the was the remark that, that so it's all point. local right you're using all the it, local information right exactly so i i i like your uh approach to marketing research right just asking people right asking for that because it does seem that we're so so how did the company actually start i mean you were you know in a big company and you decide to take the plunge what was that yeah. process about like because i mean i mean theoretically you could have like probably pushed you know suggested it to a company that you worked for and said hey this is a product we might do yeah um it's uh so so, so so yeah i would say that we did see the need for something that helps managing the storage footprint mm -hmm. quite a while uh both at google and at dropbox um and that was sort of the second component of what made me think that oh we need like we need a product like this at that time it did not occur to me that i would start a startup around this <laughs> uh, I, 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 as, as you remember i had my one year old and yeah. i was quite busy yeah, i was gonna say it's a little my, risky <laughs> at that point right <laughs> quite busy with my one year old so it took me like you know uh, six years or so past that moment <laughs> Five, five or six years past that moment to actually go ahead and do it mm -hmm. uh but uh yeah so like so, so i think it was a germ of an idea at that point or something there is a, there is a gap but you can think about sort of just naturally what the set of incentives are mm -hmm. you know we are making money when people are storing more mm -hmm. so to go and build a product that is going to help people store less is not the most natural <laughs> thing that a company might right. want to do. That's that's true because you don't because you want to uh, you know people upgrade once they fill out that storage you want them to upgrade it right I mean to the next tier because there are at least what three or four tiers on the Google One platform and Dropbox has their tiers and all that that's interesting and that's not to say that we were not going to offer tools like that and, and and we wanted to and we did and uh and, oh, sure. and google photos team still does like you can archive photos can delete photos can delete the, like, the, the, you can do all these things it's just sort of um what ends up being your bread and butter and how aggressively you pursue it mm -hmm. and i think just sort of the organizations that were part of like they put some amount of emphasis but perhaps not all the way to what a consumer what might want so you've got a you've got a co-founder so tell me about how you met her and kind of how that created the business yeah so uh, i met aparna uh back in 2021 mm -hmm. uh, she was just uh, through a through an Actually, I had somebody who was wanting to invest at that point, mm -hmm. uh, and I already was talking about the idea, and I was like, "Oh, well, you know, I don't, I, I kind of want to do it with somebody. I don't want to do it alone." Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and she's like, "Oh, I should meet a partner. She just sold her business that was also marketing to uh, to uh, to young families." Yeah, uh, she, uh, and uh, and you know, we kind of met very quickly like within a month we're like okay we want to start a business together mm -hmm. uh and we were like okay well you know let's give it a trial period let's not be sort of hasty about this we did that and 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 yeah and then kind of early 2022 we sort of officially uh started it so how does the experience that she brings in you know having a background with you know family oriented startups and media how did that help get uh the company on foot 
Yeah, I think she had a lot of insights into the psyche of that demographic. Right. Uh, she also had a lot of experience uh, thinking about, uh, like, she thought her initial product was going to do one thing, mm -hmm. and it, it or serve one demographic, and it wound up serving a very different demographic. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it, so she was kind of a bit more adept of these like vicissitudes and like the roller coaster that that is a startup life. That things are not as you expect, you, you know, compared to working in the big tech where we have a pretty good about idea about what our customers want and it's all about like really solid execution mm -hmm. so she was she really was both in terms of kind of how what are the concrete steps you do right. as well as how you manage your psychology around it honestly or like oh things are not as as, as you thought <laughs> because you may need to pivot as right. you did actually do when you started with good ones and changed to ollie so first tell me about good ones how you kind of thought that was the brand you were going for yeah so the like there there wasn't uh a, a whole lot of thought to go into naming it mm -hmm. i just I, I was like i had an idea at some point i needed a name for the idea just like so i honestly like oh that little project about like the, something related to photos organization i needed just like a short word as a shorthand and people were always like telling me whenever we were in a situation, they're like, oh, don't send me all the photos. Just send me the good ones. Just send me the good ones. Just send me the good ones. I'm like, that's a good name, like good ones. Yeah. Uh, and the idea, and and it's still to date, it's, it's in our DNA, is not so much about decluttering and sort of uh, emptying out your camera roll mm -hmm. and saving on storage, though that is like a helpful byproduct, but it's actually sort of to upgrade those those good ones. So you can you have a sort of a source of truth of what are your best photos? What are your top like 100, 200, 300, sure. 500 photos that graced your camera roll that you can later look in a slideshow in a printed photo book or in any type of artifact. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's kind of, uh, that was the idea behind good ones. And we wanted you to empower you to find the good ones in your camera roll and to uh and to you know to, to elevate them in a certain way but now you changed the name to ollie which was sort of the the technology platform what was that was that a business yeah. decision? was that a marketing decision was that you know people weren't responding to good ones so you find, got to find something more cutesy or what was the um, what was the thought process the, there so first of all ollie is the name of the octopus yes. uh which like kind of like you know duo and duolingo mm -hmm. you, you might have seen their commercials in, mm -hmm. in the super bowl and we wanted the mascot and we were like and, and at that time the, the movie my teacher octopus was all the rage if you if you remember on netflix mm -hmm. if you haven't watched it really recommend it it's like excellent <laughs> in my life uh but uh but like is there octop octopuses were having a moment ah. uh and we wanted to sort of represent the intelligence and sort of the multitask capabilities of the app because right. it's like juggling a lot of photos because it has eight eight tentacles sure and and i was ollie and then like the one reliable thing that everybody loved about our app. So we, we went to the app store early 2023. And for, a, you know, like after six months, when we looked, the one thing that reliably everybody loved is like the octopus is like, oh, the octopus is so cute. All these so cute. All these so cute. Um, and then the other thing that we heard from our users was, hey, uh, I don't want, uh, like, I want Ollie to do the work for me as opposed to me doing the work for Ollie, like me spending time sorting. So they wanted AI a lot more to the front, forefront. Hmm. And that kind of brings me to um, the, how the landscape changed between, I would say early, like early 2022 or like late 2021, which is kind of when we did our initial market research right. to sort of summer of 2023, which is when we did the rebrand. Uh, at the beginning, people were very, very hesitant about AI doing anything on their photo. Like they're like way too precious about it. And I think what happened is both the technology has advanced quite a bit, but also more importantly, the zeitgeist uh, has um, like with the with ChatGPT and everything, the zeitgeist has become much more not just accepting of uh, AI. Uh, to assist them with day-to-day -day problems, but expecting AI to deal with their day-to-day -day problems. Right. Because for a lot so, of reasons, you know, and I've had different AI experts on the podcast who talked about different things. And, you know, for from a technology standpoint, people have been interacting with AI for years. They just may not have realized it, right? 
you know, and when you're when you're doing with some of the the chat bots, or if you're calling a phone line, and you know, you keep talking to an AI, and there's other all kinds of AI assist that happens behind the scenes, and most people don't even weren't even aware it was AI, and now, but like you said, it's become to the forefront, and people now can actually go and play with it and kind of see the usefulness of it. I mean, you may not, you know, really be thrilled with the results that a chat GPT or a mid journey gives you, but at least you've played with it. You kind of see what it can do and whatever. So the, the, the barrier, the inhibitors to accepting what an AI can do for you, I think is lowered. So I think you're exactly right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like definitely it's in the last, like, I think sort of the technological breakthroughs mm-hmm. uh, that have allowed us chat gpt and mid journey like you know the, the uh sort of llms and uh specifically gpt and the and the diffusion models mm-hmm. where like late 2010s early 2020s like kind of like were available and the people who were in the now were already like oh my god this is a huge breakthroughs are coming and then I think like uh, October 2022 was uh, or, or November 2022 when ChatGPT came. That was the that was a killer product that sort of opened everybody's mind to it, mm-hmm. and then kind of the rest is history. But but it had built up to that point. That's the thing. Isn't yep. it? And I think yep. what's interesting is that you know now, I mean back then if you had AI, you trumpeted, "Hey, we've got AI." Now it's sort of a given. Right? Yep. People are expecting everything to have AI. I mean, now, you know, Meta is now yelling at me that I got to have Meta AI on my phone and yada, yada, yada. And it's just kind of a given thing. So given given that you've got AI building, can you kind of talk about that a little bit? I don't want to like divulge any secrets about how your thing works, but, you know, what are some of the parameters in terms of what it will do for the user that, 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 that that's now at the forefront, right? Now that Ali is you know, got his tentacles into everything, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can tell you, like, actually the interaction model that we're thinking about. Mm. Uh, very initially, the way we conceive this is the user, like, you would go through all your photos. Essentially, like, you would go through, like, batch by batch, like, bit by bit, just go through, like, hey, this is good, this is bad, this is going to be the, tr- the trash, etc. That's what we started from. And we said, like, oh, well, we'll throw some initial filters in there to make it a little easier for you. So you can think about sort of the tandem of the user and the AI, like, and how do they work together as a team, which I think is just generally the most, like, generally the paradigm to think about. Right. Uh, so so it the was, user is more or less training the AI, if you will. Th- so, so, so that's what we shifted towards. So the initially, like, the user was fully in the driver's seat doing most of the work, and the AI was kind of like a little bit of assistance. It was, uh, was given a little bit of assistance. Right. Um, we've shifted over time to uh, to, like, uh, in, initially, like the literally one by one, the user had to process everything. Now, what we're doing is the AI is actually giving you like recommendations for to what to do for every single photo, right? And you can press accept or you can change, mm-hmm. right? And that will train the AI model mm-hmm. uh, for you specifically. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a good way to replicate like what's your desires. Mm-hmm. And a really good mental model that I found is that. Imagine if you had a person who was like helping you out with uh, with photos mm-hmm. and, and videos, and you kind of tell them like you, know, you might tell them, "Hey, try to pick one where I look good." That's what the, most people want to pick mm-hmm. the photo. Like, yeah. If you pick eight, eight of the photos, I look good. Or you know what? Uh, whenever I take like ten photos, I only want I want a favorite one and keep like three or four that are good and then the rest of them you can delete. So you sort of give those parameters and train. Mm-hmm. And that's what, what you're gonna what you're doing with Ollie. Mm-hmm. And we're we're like and we've moved more and more from this more manual mode to this more automatic mode. And there are still a couple of breakthroughs that we need to do to make it fully, fully working for the user. But the dream is that you would open the camera roll and you would find it exactly organized to your tastes and any change you would do um, would uh, would in turn create like ripple down like, oh, I get it. Gary likes to keep like five of the same photo. Uh, right. So it will learn over time kind of your, your preferences. When, when the user and I encourage everyone to go to, you know, Ali and download the app but but it's a separate app from the camera roll but interacts directly with the camera roll data correct so it's almost like a view of the camera roll through ollie's ai correct correct yes 
okay. does not create a new source of truth, which very early on our market research realized that's not what people want. <laughs> people don't want another place to drop their photos. So we work fully with iCloud, with Google Photos directly. So it's it's an organization layer on top of whatever you're already using. Mm -hmm. And you actually have a monetization model, which is a refreshing thing because a lot of these things, you know, they I'm not sure what the model is like throw your ads at you or something. You don't do ads. So talk a little bit about was that from you know in the intent from the beginning that you're gonna have a subscription model or what was your thought process there? Yeah. Uh, I mean there is essentially two ways to like well I guess three ways to monitor a consumer product ads subscriptions and number three like marketplace transaction fees if there, there is some 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 selling that is going on uh, you could see all three of them number apply. four sell prints <laughs> so, so that would be that would be that would be that would be three right like if, if, if I'm, the I know, I'm, I'm just throwing some out to my printing friends out there you can always yes yeah. And and that's the three part which we also thought about or we also th thought about like actually ink uh like one thing we're still thinking about is creating a subscription which includes prints right so right now we're charging like i don't know like uh four dollars a month something like that uh when you pay annually like 350 a month when you pay annually uh but what we've discovered is people willingness to pay shoots way up if you include a printed uh product as part of your as you mean part of you mean almost like a uh, monthly book or something a monthly subscription like oh, kind of nice. reminds so you of like chat up against books the chat book uh, books and if you other i mean we, we we're not this is not our focus right now it's something for way in the future we're thinking and it could be like we have not yeah. you know no i'm just any... saying i mean that's interesting that's so that because because you've got some some smarts on the back end to help determine that it it could even be like you could envision it being a partnership with somebody sure. like Chatter yeah, no, exactly. or, 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 or 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 anyone else yeah. because you know like actually their um, sort of capabilities which is a very heavy operational burden we're we're a software company ourselves right. uh, yeah, we're yeah, fully yeah. fully on, on the software side um and we we knew that ads had no place in the product yeah that that we knew uh that like it's you we're, never we're make enough be... money off ads to avoid pissing yeah. your consumers exactly also the joy i don't know like we were just like the joy that photos bring like should not be tainted with the ads um are you and, sure you uh, once worked at google i'm just joking so i worked at google one <laughs> uh, that was a subscription product of google and, and there was and no they, ads uh, there actually that there were this no one, ads. they don't put ads in google photos which is pretty nice. exactly and we really did believe in it that like we can create a great 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 uh consumer product that is worth paying for and right. it gets better over time and and that's what we still believe in mm. like exactly like you mentioned it's refreshing because uh you put you know at the end of the day uh, once you put monetization in there it really tells you do people actually want this mm -hmm. are they willing to pay for it or are we like so so that we wanted from very quickly we wanted to get to a point where we're we have some monetization model and i'm glad we did because it, it sort of reaffirmed a, a lot of our beliefs that this is a big problem mm -hmm. that if consumers are willing to pay for it mm -hmm. and yeah we're really glad that we did it so uh so what are the tiers people can participate in yeah so right now uh the free product you know people uh people can use and can can like the only difference between the free product and the uh and the paid product at this juncture is it it essentially um does not the free product bumps you like gives you a prompt to buy the paid product so you get the you remove the prompt so that was just very initially just kind of like reaffirmed that there is something to pay for yeah. and that already saw like I, I can't again discuss the numbers but really really good results mm -hmm. so people were finding enough value to say hey i'm willing to pay for this it's a good product it's worth it for me and they were doing it mm -hmm. um and uh, over time you can imagine it will differentiate those the free tier and the paid tier mm -hmm. sure and and you've actually had some success with some investment in the last few months can you talk a little bit about bringing on investors and is, what has that done for the company um yeah i mean we, we were venture funded uh really fantastic we're really lucky to be uh working with phenomenal investors uh like uh backing some successful unicorns and, mm. and some consumer companies and some ai companies mm. and that's been tremendously valuable because it also it allows us to shoot really really far to take really big swings mm -hmm. because we're not you know like though we want to we do want to monetize uh it allows us to uh, do it in a way that is thoughtful and not sort of uh, kind of with our backs against the walls. So it allows us to 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 give 
big big swings that that, that, would, that would that would with like great growth mm -hmm. potential even even if it means that they're gonna pay off later and you can imagine like a lot of this ai research mm. is not yielding fruit immediately <laughs> uh so so it actually a lot gives us the, the it's a space uh, and the breath to do to do all of that it's a, it, i've heard i've had a friend of mine who's got a an ai uh, photo app say it's a relentless appetite is ai it is relentless in its it demands. Does, <laughs> it does have a lot of demands, both on the personnel side and mm -hmm. also on the compute side. So it's yeah. it's it's uh, it's we're we're lucky to have that backing, and and of course uh, not just monetarily, but also their advice and their yeah. Well, um, that's what I was going to get to. That's why I kind of yeah. brought up is that I mean you've got some experienced people from the list I saw of investors, and you know they have had some six, past successes with with, and that's you know that is a role that. Uh, taking on a, a good venture capital partner can be is they can coach you. They want to mentor. Yep. You. They don't just want to, you know, give you money and hope you, you know. Yeah, uh, they want they want you to also return the money with a great multiple. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> uh, yeah. So I mean, it, it's it's been great to have their support. Uh, they have like there is a lot of things. So um, just kind of my general advice to founders is investors can give you very great generic company running advice mm -hmm. like what uh, they are and it's it's great to count them on that mm -hmm. but uh for your specific problem face problem space you want to like like what great advice is going to come to like how to fundraise how to run how to do hiring how to do operational things mm -hmm. if you want to look at like how to great build a great photo product what are some photo needs for people like things that have to do with your own problem space you're kind of you should stay on your own right. uh, and not take like i don't know feature advice from, from your investors but they they're also there to like oh like this is the thing that is happening in the company and it seems like the end of the world to you but guess what i've seen three others in the last throughout 12 months that the exact same thing happened it's very normal yeah I'm kind of coaching you through that so that's that's been really really uh awesome to have because it is one of the things that i don't know if people understand about you know being a, a founder or a, you know startup person you know yes you have your team but in a lot of ways it can be very isolating right because you're focusing on your product and to get some advice who's maybe hey maybe they've got other people they're advising and they can say hey you know this person's running into this issue maybe you should talk to them and that network interaction is super important yeah and i mean it's not necessarily about the product itself it's right. just the type of challenges that you're that exactly. you're going through like i don't know uh, a year and so ago svb went under and uh, it's like a value bank i don't know if uh, yep, yep. you remember that but like we had a good amount of our money parked there so like everybody's scrambling and it's really good to have a couple of people to talk to like what are, what are other people doing so uh it's it's, it's tremendously helpful so where can people go for information about Ali and to, you know, get the app and play with it and hopefully subscribe and also, you know, maybe reach out to you and, and if they want to connect with you. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, first of all, uh, the app is get Ali uh, and the Ali spelled as O L L I E mm -hmm. like short for Oliver, I guess, uh, we never called him Oliver, but he is, I guess, uh, Oliver. Mm -hmm. So get Ali.ai and you will see kind of our product there uh and you can you have a link to download it it's only on iphone it's not on android yet mm -hmm. um so so that's the first thing um uh, and then there i'd love everybody to connect with me on linkedin and uh, so is uh, israel or is shalom um and uh, i'm also planning to be at visual first like last year so it was mm -hmm. a great great program yeah. so i'm, I'm yeah. looking forward to meeting everybody there so just yeah. connect with me there and if you just need to shoot me an email it's is iz at uh get ali.ai Great. Well, great. It is great to see you again. Looking forward to seeing you in October at uh, Visual First. Thank you. For, thank you for the time, Gary. Thank you for listening to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. Read more great stories and sign up for the newsletter at www.thedeadpixelssociety.com.